Well, the show has taught us two things. One, all politics are crazy, and two, the 80s is definitely making a comeback. Hey guys, can I remember the series premiere of the new show on CBS called Brain Dead, Season 1, Episode 1, The Insanity Principle, or How Extremism in Politics is Throwing Democracy in the 21st Century. While there's a mouthful to say, I kind of saw the episode titles as like, if you're in class, like a business, like in a politics class or something, and like they're teaching you a subject, it's kind of like that. Uh, I'm just calling it The Insanity Principle because I don't think I have enough room to type that whole thing on YouTube. But either way, guys, I was really interested in the show, to say the least. I mean, I didn't really know how the show was going to be because how weird the concept was, but I heard this, this show was very weird. It seemed like even the people in the show were trying to be very hush-hush about because they didn't really know how to describe it, and... After seeing this first episode, I can understand that because there really is nothing on TV quite like this show. I mean, I've seen shows similar to this, but not really like this show. I mean, this show is weird, it's different, but it's really all the better for it. This was a really great first episode. I really did love it overall, and I think um, the way this episode is done, I think is just really fun overall, and uh, there's a lot of really good stuff here. But let's just get into this episode because I really did enjoy it. We start off where we see a montage of all these different politicians speaking, and basically it says, in the year 2016, there was a growing sense that people were losing their minds, and no one knew why until now, which I think is the perfect way to start things out, because yeah, a lot of people aren't really supporting this election that's going to be happening in November, mainly because one, they don't probably like the politics involved, but two, also because a lot of people have said this is not at all a realistic, um, you know, election. These people have gone crazy, they're not saying rational things, and this episode is basically trying to describe why, which is pretty funny, the way that this show is doing that, but... We see these strange objects then drop out of the sky across the world. We don't know who that is, but we don't we don't know why they, who, what they are, but we just know they're dropping from the sky across the world. And then we meet our main character, Laurel Healy. She's on the phone in what used to be her room, wondering how she'll come up with the money. And once she's done, she goes down to the party, and her brother's center, Luke Healy, sees her. He calls over his wife, Jermaine, and an aide interrupts to say that he has a budget call from the Smithsonian to deal with. And Luke insists on having Laurel with him, and he takes her out to the kitchen. Now, I haven't heard the name Laurel since Arrow so it's kind of cool to have another Laurel again. Um, so he takes her out to the kitchen to make mojitos, and as she works, Lou tells his sister that their father is consulting for the R-Med services and is using her room, and Laurel claims that things are working out fine in L.A., but finally admits that her loan fell through after her last documentary was less than successful. So... We see right away she's a documentary filmmaker, she's kind of struggling, and however she refuses to let Luke help her, insisting that she can control her own life, and she's not going to let him make the decision for her. And as they chat, Luke continues talking with Dr. Daudier at the Smithsonian. Daudier insists that his joint project is important, and they're working with the Russian Institute to, re to recover a meteor. He hopes that Luke can get him an additional $40 million, and Luke says he can get him $5 million and... Dottier then talks with Dr. Laganov on the other line, said that they have a bit of a problem. Laganov says that they're able to, uh, not able, they're about to bring the meteor up, and Dottier asks if he can do it cheaper. The Russian scientist reluctantly looks at his already low-budget workers, and off the shore, two divers approach the meteor, see fish in formation, looking back at them. We don't know, again, what this meteor is, what's really going on there. I like that mystery surrounding it. They did a very good job with keeping that mystery intact, because, you know, we didn't really know what was going on, and unless you saw a promo of the show, you don't know what's going on. Like, it's not easy to tell and I like the way they did that. I think that mystery is one of the things that works really well in the show. But it's silly, so it doesn't really matter. It's not something that's integral to the show. But just adding that bit of intrigue and suspense, I thought was really well done the way the show did that because, you know, when you have a mystery like this, you gotta keep that mystery as intact as possible otherwise it doesn't feel earned and it feels kind of underwhelming. But this did not all feel that way. I thought it was very well done. I definitely really did like that. So up in Laurel's room, her father Dean tells her that she should come home. Laurel insists that she's home in L.A., but Dean explains they're on the verge of a government shutdown, and there's an opening in Dean's office. She insists that she hates politics in D.C., and she really wants nothing to do with them. You know, this is not really her thing, but Dean offers to pay off her student loans if she helps. Laurel says she'll do it for $200,000, but will do the job for six months if Dean finances half. She figures that Dean wants someone in Luke's office to keep him informed, and he tries to negotiate her to a year, but Laurel refuses to negotiate, and and Dean agrees. 
So the next day, Laurel goes to Dean's office, finds Dean's assistance on the phone. The Republicans are threatening to shut down the government, according to CRS anchor Claudia Monarch, and Dean's aide, Scarlett Pierce, collects Laurel and says that she'll be on her own with eight, con with eight uh, constitutes, and um, Laurel will investigate their, compla their complaints and try to satisfy them. And Scarlett then leads her to the conference room where she'll be trying to keep them happy. Laurel introduces her to the eight constitu to, uh, to the eight uh, constituents and admits that it's her first day, and they all just stare at her because they don't understand understand obviously why she's there the fact that she has all this power things like that um you know, they can't believe it's actually your first day. So Laurel starts talking with the constituents, and they all have annoying problems. One man wants to give Luke a chocolate dog, wonders why Laurel's trying to keep him away from Luke, and when she tries to resolve them, she ends up on hold. Luke comes in, says that she's glad he's she's there, and notices the chocolate dog. He takes the phone from Laurel, cheerfully uses power as a center to get things moving. Finally, she meets with, and some of the best scenes in episode were just her talking with the different uh, constituents. They were all so weird and so eccentric and really funny stuff. Stuff. She then meets with the last constituent, though, Brenna Burke, and this is really when we start to find out what's going on. It says her husband, Randall, isn't her husband. He stopped drinking. He works as an engineer on a container ship, the Alba, and Brenna has found a video that the crew made for insurance purposes and shows Randall investigating a container that they heard a noise inside of, and when he opens the door, he discovers that the container is seemingly empty. So, clearly, something weird is going on there. Randall goes in with the crewman holding the camera, finds a crate with a hole in it, and there's some kind of big rock inside, and Something squeaks behind the crate. The two men investigate. Something leaps out at them. Brennan insists that something happened to Randall, and she needs Laurel's help to basically find out what. Because obviously, something weird is not going on. He's, you know, he's not um, normal, and she doesn't really understand why. So then we see a man, Gareth Ritter, he barges in, asks to talk to Laurel, um, which just a hilarious scene. Aaron Tveit always is great here, but he really did a great job in this first episode. She says she's with someone, Gareth leaves, and uh, Bre Brianna, not Brenna, Brianna says, uh, Bre Brenna says that she came there first because the office signed off on the crates. And on the news, Claudia continues to report about the fur upcoming physical uh, Armageddon, and Laurel comes out and finds Gareth watching the news, the way he just bursts in before she finally talks to him. She goes to the next office and asks Scarlett why they signed off on a crate from Russia, and as Scarlet wonders what she means, Laurel sees Gareth giving his card to Brianna, and she meets with Gareth, who misses he's there under false pretenses, and he's actually a legislative director for Senator Raymond Red Wiedis. Now, the best part about this is that that is the opposing uh, to who her father is, because her father obviously wants to be senator and everything, and this is um, the opposing... Um, you know, candidate. This he is a Republican candidate, and they're obviously Democrat, and they're definitely going to clash. And I like the way that was done. And they're basically he's a Republican senator from Maryland. Gareth is there to offer a secret deal on Red's behalf, and right away you can tell she definitely does not trust him. I mean, obviously, you know, she's thinking that he's going to rat on her, or whatever. That part I think is really interesting the way that was done, and um, basically. We can see that, uh, you know, Gareth is there to, uh, Red is willing to vote with the Democrats if they'll earmark him 48 for autism studies. And basically, you know, seems like he's willing to appeal to them, so it doesn't sound like it's anything that bad. Well, Laurel hesitates, Gareth gives her his card, says Luke has 9 minutes to agree, if anybody finds out, 90 minutes to agree, and if anybody finds out about it, then the deal goes away, and Gareth warns that 100,000 jobs depend on Luke taking the deal, and advises Laurel to run. So basically, and, uh, Laurel runs for the Capitol. I love the scene where they're like, no running in the Capitol, but she has to run no fast walking in the Capitol. A hilarious scene. Love the way that was done. Gets Luke's voicemail, but is interrupted when Dean calls to see how her day is going. She says she has to call him back, hangs up, runs into the Capitol. Laurel runs to Senator Spitz, who says that Luke went to dinner. He sends her to a restaurant where Luke went. The matriarch says that Luke already left with a red-headed woman, and next Laurel goes to Scarlett's home, yells that she knows Luke is in there. Luke is in bed with Scarlett, and once he lets Laurel in, she tells him a deal, and he calls the Democrat senators, and Luke figures that they'd be better off if the Republicans shoot themselves in the foot. And one of the things they do so well in this episode is showing the common between Democrats and Republicans, but it's not what's supposed to be taken seriously. It's supposed to be a political farce in the sense that the Democrats blame the Republicans for everything and the Republicans blame the Democrats for everything. It's just how it usually is. And it really is just really ridiculous. And I think it's really just poking fun at that. And Laura, and really, I think in reality, this is really how crazy and ridiculous it is. And Laurel points out that it's 100,000 people out of work. He ushers her to where Scarlett is in the hallway. Scarlett says that it isn't serious with Luke 
and Luke comes out, tells Laurel that they're going to refuse Red's office. Laurel starts punching him for cheating on Jermaine and pointing out that Jermaine is eight months pregnant. And again, it's not meant to be taken seriously because it's it's really just silly. And even though he's cheating on his wife, obviously he's cheating on his wife. And she finally stops long enough for him to go upstairs and change. Laurel then calls Garrett, tells him that Luke isn't taking the deal. Garrett says that all the people out of work are on her and hangs up. And obviously he's really angry because he really does want to help these people. And he get that sense that he really does want to make a difference. And her brother, the only reason he doesn't want to do that is because, um, you know, Gareth is Republican and he doesn't want to represent Republicans, which you can understand, obviously. You know, if you have a, sp a specific political belief, you want to appeal to said political belief. You don't want to go against that political belief, and he clearly, you know, doesn't want to do that either. You can definitely tell. So back at the Smithsonian, Dottier is examining the meteor when a guard comes in, tells them that they have to leave because of a budget shutdown, and once they leave and shut off all the lights, millions of small bugs break out of the meteor and crawl out the window, and right when we can tell what's going on, something has to do with these bugs, and we don't really know what it is. The next day, Laurel arrives at Luke's office, discovers that the building and the streets are mostly abandoned, and she finally locates Luke, telling his staff the Republican shutdown is forcing him to furlough all but two of them, and Laurel and his chief of staff, the workers glare at Laurel as they leave. Laurel tells Luke that he's just keeping her on because she's his sister. That's the only reason. Luke tells her that if she feels guilty, then she should work twice as hard, and soon Laurel is at the Alba investigating Brianna's claim, and on the bridge we hear You Might Think is playing in the background, which is a big part of this entire episode. Why, like I said, in the intro, the 80s is back, you know, we definitely hear that throughout this entire episode, and I really feel bad for people that don't like that song, because if you don't like that song, you probably, you know, did not like this episode, because it's played throughout it constantly, and the Captain Gary Yun says that everyone changes when they're at sea, he doesn't ask which crew member they're talking about, that she's talking about, and Laura points out that that's unusual, she then talks to a crewman, asks to see the cargo manifest, and realizes that the crewman is the one who took the video, so the first mate, Chuck Sanders, says that he has no idea what Laurel's talking about, you know, he's never heard of this before, and Chuck says that he gave it out to a man named Gareth earlier that morning, and Laurel goes to Red's office, doesn't see anyone there, she finally locates Red dozing on his couch, and wonders if Laurel is his masseuse, and you can tell right away this guy is pretty much crazy, and Laurel says that she isn't, he goes back to sleep, she finds Gareth who points out that he sent 20 staffers, he sent home 20 staffers in tears, Laurel tries to talk to Luke about Brianna as he walks out, she threatens to claim he's a democrat unless he deals with her, and they go outside, Gareth says the ALBA had scientific research material that had been signed off on by Luke's office, and Gareth talked to Chuck and he said the same thing that Gary did, Laurel points out that it's word for word and wonders why they agreed on a story, Gareth figures that She's paranoid, but says that Red is still interested in a deal, and he tells Laurel to convince Luke to take the deal. Later, Luke and Laurel meet at the bar. Laurel suggests that her brother trust Red, and that it's not furlough. It's not going to be furlough, and, you know, he's not freelancing, you know, because, um, you know, Garrett, Luke thought that it was freelancing, but he's not a freelancer. Luke says that he cares less about autism, but Gareth has a sister who is autistic, and he says that he broke his affair with Scarlett, and that has nothing to do with Dean having an affair with his secretary, and Laurel points out that she left home when she found out. Luke says will consider the deal if Gareth isn't freelancing. She then asks him about the papers for Dottier and his Russian ex um, exped expeditioners, and Luke looks at the papers. Laurel points out that a lot of people are staring at them, but Luke says that it's standard for politicians in D.C., and once he leaves, Laurel calls Brianna to update her on her investigation. Randall comes down, asks who his wife is talking to, and Brianna says it's a friend from class, and she quickly ends the call. You can get the sense that she's kind of scared of her husband. Randall says that they need to do something about the Republicans. Later, Randall gets into bed, and with a nervous Brianna and says that he hasn't been himself recently, and honestly, this scene was kind of scary, the way it was done. He says he's been angry about the world, kisses Brianna, grabs her, bugs swarming through the window, crawl onto the bed. Randall gags Brianna, tells her not to struggle, he assures that she'll be herself, but a better part of herself, as the bugs crawl onto her head, and clearly she's gonna be infected as well. I mean, again, we don't really know what's going on here, and that intrigue, like I said, is very well executed in that scene. You don't really know why this is happening, and the way they did that, I definitely really did like. I thought that was really good, and again, when the show needs to be silly, it's silly, but it also is scary at points. I think it did a good job with capturing both the scares and the laughs. So the next day, Laurel meets with Gareth, asks if he's freelancing. She figures that he's making up an offer to get money for his sister. Gareth admits that he's deal-making and says that all Laurel has to do is convince her brother to deal. Disgusted, Laurel goes back to Luke. She has to keep going back and forth to Luke, to Gareth. It's pretty funny. She goes back to Luke but says that Gareth isn't freelancing. She asks if Luke wants to make a deal. He says that he'll think about it. Angry, Laurel goes to her office, calls Dean, tells him that Luke has a chance to make a deal, but he's hesitating, and she wants her father to convince Luke to take the deal. Dean says that she may not like politics, but she is good at it, and that 
that this is something that she might consider doing. I kind of see Laurel maybe going in the direction of, as the show goes on, maybe enjoying politics. I could really see that happening. Just the way this is going, it seems like that's where we're headed. Luke comes in and tells Laurel that she did a good job. Brianna and Rail are in the next room, have been telling Luke what a good job Laurel did. Brianna says she was paranoid, and now everything is great, and it's clear that she's not herself right now. Randall says the same thing that Carrie and Chuck said, and Laurel recites it along with him. The Burks want to give Luke $2,600 for his re-election campaign, and Randall insists that they want to do anything they can to stop the Republicans from ruining the country. Laurel talks to Brianna, warns her she'd been abused, but Brianna says she's happy, tells Laurel not to question happiness, and once the couple leaves, Laurel tells Luke that she came there to stop her investigation. Luke doesn't believe it, and is called away to take a call from Dean, and soon Luke meets with Gareth and Red at a restaurant. The two senators are soon drinking and chatting like old buddies, and meanwhile, Gareth and Laurel watch. Gareth chats with her about her next documentary. It's about Mal uh, Malaysian choirs, and Gareth is surprised to learn that Laurel is an idealist. They start arguing liberals versus conservatives, and you don't get the sense... What I like about the show is that it's not, a you know, one side or the other. It's both sides. It's showing both sides of it. It's showing, you know, how strong liberals are, how strong conservatives are. I like the way that was done, and the way these two have to bond over that, even though, again, and Laurel isn't a huge, isn't really a big surprise, you know, doesn't really care as much um, about, uh, you know, politics, she is very strong with her liberal values. It's just how she's been raised, and meanwhile, Red and Luke, uh, commiserate together about ethics rules, and as she and Gareth argue, Laurel again hears You Might Think playing, and she wonders why she keeps hearing it, because every time, she constantly is hearing it throughout this episode, and she doesn't know what that means, and we still don't know really what that means. That's something that I think is interesting. It's the way they use a song, and we wonder what that means. Meanwhile, a waiter stares at her. Laurel tells Gareth that something weird is going on, but he figures that she's just easily distracted, and that, you know, he says again, the A's is making a comeback, so... Luke and Red come over, says that they'll hold a joint press conference the next day, and once Red and Gareth leave, Luke congratulates Laurel on saving the DC economy. Dr. Daudier calls Laurel about her inquiry, that's th that she thinks someone was infected by the meteor, and at home, a drunken Red opens his bedroom window, gets ready for bed, he passes out, bugs crawl in through the window, climb up on the bed, crawl into the unconscious Red's ear, he suddenly jerks up, pounds on his ear, his brains fall out of one ear onto the pillow, he pokes at it and it pops, and he falls back unconscious, and now we know what's going on exactly. Obviously, you know, his brain literally fell out, bugs went in, and that's exactly what happens. Now, it's really a crazy concept, but again, it's really silly, and the way they did that, I definitely really did enjoy. Um, so the next morning, he's forced to clean his sheet, and he immediately puts You Might Think onto his playlist. So now we know why we're hearing it so much. People that get bugs in their brain, You Might Think automatically goes on your playlist. Now, why this happens, I don't fucking know, honestly. I mean, the episode doesn't really give me any reason why this happens, um, but I feel like that's one of the parts that's one of the intriguing parts of the show is that we don't know why this is happening why out of all songs you might think why is that constantly played throughout this episode why is that in your head you know why does that keep happening and liquid oozes out of his ear he wipes it away he then goes to his office tells gareth that he's feeling great red tosses away all of his alcohol says he's not making the deal with luke he gives gareth a number to call instead and Laurel goes to the Smithsonian, asks to see Daudier, and the guard says they're closed. Laurel points out that she works with Luke, and he's considering budget cuts in security, and he lets her in, close the door behind Laurel. The lights are off, Laurel sees the crate up ahead, there's no one in the room, and she looks at the crate, something moves in the next room, and she goes to investigate, she finds Daudier literally lying on the ground, calling for the guard. We don't know what's going on there, but such a sight to see. The EMTs then arrive, get Dottie into the ambulance, he tells Laurel that they're inside of him, his mind is going, he screams the EMTs to get them out, his brain explodes out of his ear, and literally in that scene, I mean, it's, it's meant to be taken seriously, and it's... It's kind of strange that this scene was meant to be taken seriously. That's really one of the only things I'm complaining about is that the tone was a bit unbalanced in this scene. Suddenly it was serious and then it wasn't. It was just kind of weird. So at Red's office, Garrett tells Red that he is coming. Red says that he'll meet him in Garrett's office. Now, who's he? We don't know. Garrett wonders if Red really wants to do it. Red says that he's tired of begging for legislative clout. And after Garrett brings Spitz in, Red meets with him, offers Spitz several ranking chairs and a $14 million more chest. He says Republicans and Democrats are just brands and says it's time to make history, and basically you can tell that he's not, you know, obviously himself. Laurel's in taking a shower to watch Dottie's blood off of her. Dean calls, tells her the news, and when Laurel
Cole goes to her office. She discovers that Spitz has crossed the aisle, giving a majority to the Republicans. Everyone's packing to move. Scarlett tells Laurel that Luke is at his office out, that they're in the minority. And at the new office, Laurel apologizes to Luke. He says that it's great. Promises to destroy Red and Spitz. Laurel and Scarlett are going to help him do it. Laurel asks what she can do. Luke steps out to take a call. The secretary listening, you might think, smiles at Laurel. Obviously, we know that she has bugs in her, and that is the way the episode ends. Now let's get into this episode, because obviously there's a lot to talk about. So really, a lot of good stuff here. I thought this was a very well done first episode. I really did enjoy it overall. Um, there were a lot of things I really did enjoy here. I honestly, I think, enjoy this a little bit more than the guilt pilot. Not the guilt pilot was bad, but just if I had to pick, I'd say this one definitely was better. This one definitely was a bit more balanced. You know, it didn't introduce 20 million characters. It introduced a few characters, and I thought they kept the story, you know, very grounded as well, and I'll talk about that. But let's get to the acting, because that's definitely one of the things that makes this show so great. Now, going into the show, one of the things that definitely intrigued me was the cast here, and mainly from the two leads. Of course, our main lead, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, you know, just had that awesome 10 Cloverfield Lane. If you guys haven't seen it, she gives an amazing performance in that movie, and she really shows, you know, I think how great of an actress she is, and she's really great here. You can tell she's having a lot of fun with the role. You can tell she's not taking it too seriously, and the character of Laurel, I really do like. I like that she's a documentary filmmaker, and she's not really interested in politics, but she does have strong beliefs, and she's been raised, you know, on a very liberal household clearly and this is who she is and she doesn't really agree with what um you know the republicans are doing but she's kind of forced to ally with them and it's interesting to see how that's gonna go i like that conflict overall she has really great comedic timing in this first episode but also i think plays things really seriously when she needs to she does a very good job with that and you know she's been in both comedy and drama you know she was in scott pilgrim and she was in town chlorophyll lane and it's great to see she finally has this show i'm very i'm very happy that she's finally you know getting to show herself to television audiences is. I think she did an awesome job in this first episode. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more of her character, and she definitely stands out um, greatly in this first episode. Now, do I really need to say that Aaron Tveit is great? Not really. I mean, I think that we expect Aaron Tveit to be great in everything because he's just such a great actor, and he is. He's fantastic in this show. I think he really gives a great performance as, you know, uh, Gareth because he's kind of shady at first. You don't even know if you can trust him, but you can tell he really genuinely wants to make this deal. He wants to help people that have autism. You know, his sister clearly has it, and he wants to help people with it. I like the way they show in this episode. I think he did a very good job, and I really do like his character. And the chemistry he has uh, with you know, um, Mary Elizabeth Winstead definitely is there. I don't think it's like a romantic chemistry or anything, but you definitely do get the sense that these two are going to be, you know, going to bond very well, and they are going to be friends, and I like the way that was done. I like the two characters introduced in this episode. I definitely really did enjoy them, and I think they both did a very good job. Um, definitely, you know, Aaron Tveit's, I think it's expected for him to be great. This is his second show. It's great that he has another show, because Graceland, of course, was cancelled, but it's great to see him in another show. I'm very happy that he's here, and uh, I think definitely it's it's awesome to see him have another show here. Like I said, I'm looking forward to seeing more with his character. I definitely really like what they did with him in this first episode. And then I also really like Danny Pino here, who's clearly having a lot of fun as Luke, and I like the clashing between him and Gareth. The fact that, you know, Luke just blames the Republicans for everything, Gareth blames the Democrats, I think is really fun. You kind of get the sense that Gareth is a bit more grounded, and Luke is kind of just like very much, oh, it's the Republicans' fault, while Gareth isn't really that way. He comes across as kind of sincere and just a nice guy overall, and I like seeing that with this character. I like that it's not one side, you're like, it's not like, oh, we're pro-Democrats, we're pro-Republicans. It's really just showing how crazy the situation is, but I really did like his character. You can tell there obviously is a lot going on, like he cheated on his wife, obviously. There's a reason why this affair actually happened, you don't really know. But I like what they did with this character, though he did a good job. Um, you know, he's probably my least favorite character introduced to in this episode, but I did like what they did with him here. I thought overall he was really good. My only problem with this show, I think, is with Tony Shaloub as Rhett Wheatus. Something about Red Wheatus as a character... I just am not really latched onto his character. I don't think he was bad. He even, he's obviously, Tony Shalhoub is a great actor, obviously. I mean, we've known that from Monk things. I don't watch Monk, but I just heard he was really good in that. He was good here. It's just his character. When he got the bugs in his head, he didn't see, and, you know, his brain was removed and the bugs went into his brain. He didn't seem any different to me than when he was, you know, normal. It didn't really seem like he was that different. He seemed just as crazy, and I can't really tell where they're going with this character, you know, how different he is, because he doesn't seem that different, really. That's something that I don't really see. Other than that, though, I really did enjoy the show. It's just that character right now, I'm just not a huge fan of. I don't think he's bad, necessarily. 
It's just, it seems like he's a bit over the top, especially pro, you know, pre-bugs in his head. He just seemed way too over the top and very much like a cartoon. And because everyone else is kind of playing it kind of subdued and not as crazy as he is, it just doesn't really work as well as, you know, you want it to. I don't think he's bad necessarily. It's just he didn't really, his character didn't really change much for me after the bugs went into his brain. He seemed very much the same and he seemed just as crazy, um, you know, before, um, you know, he, his brain was, you know, removed basically. But overall, the acting is not bad. I think everyone really does do a good job. Everyone does give a really good performance here. I also like Zach Greenier as uh, Dean Healy, and there's a lot of actually uh, Broadway actors in this first episode. So Megan Hilty was in here. Beth Malone was in here. I didn't really... Beth Malone was actually uh, the woman that kept talking on the TV. Megan Hilty was here. I'd have to look at what her role was, but I can't really think right now. Overall, uh, the writing here is really the thing that I think is the best thing. The writers clearly know what they're doing. They have a very well-established tone. That's something that I definitely will say that stuck out to me, is that the tone here is is very weird, but it doesn't deviate away from that tone. I think the only time it did was the scene with Dr. Daudier where suddenly he's convulsing and it's like serious. I don't know why we played that scene off as serious. I get that the situation is supposed to be serious, but it seems like a show that's not taking itself too seriously, and then there's that one point where it is taking itself seriously. I just thought it was a bit strange. To me, the political stuff, yes, you can take that seriously, but the whole point of like Dr. Daudier, that I thought was a bit too serious. I don't really know why they played that off as as silly. I thought, you know, they didn't play that off as silly. They played it as serious. I don't really know why they had to do that because it seemed like the show is not taking itself too seriously, and that's one of the things that's working so well in the show. The writing here overall I really do like. There was a lot of really fun little small bits, like her just running, everyone saying, you know, no running. I think that's really interesting. What is the obsession with you might think? What does that have to do with anything? Why is this happening? You know, who can get this? Who is contracting it? You know, what is the reason for all this? We don't really know. I think that overall is really interesting. I like that it's not global. Like, it's not everyone. It's only a few set people right now, but I feel like as the show's gonna go on, it's gonna get more and more, and we'll see what happens with that, but that's gonna be interesting. I'm hoping this first season doesn't do too much, because a lot of shows like this, they try to infect too many characters before you know, before the first season is over, and I'm hoping the show does do well, because I feel like it is going to get renewed for a second season, just because it's a really strong premiere, and uh, I'm hoping that, you know, because of that, things do work well there, we'll have to see what happens with that. Uh, the cinematography here is great, I think the effects here, you know, the way you have the bugs, I mean, there were some really creepy scenes this first episode, I definitely will say it, like, there were some scenes that were kind of genuinely scary, and definitely did like that, there's a bit of a throwback to 80s horror here that I definitely really did appreciate, but also kind of like a creature feature, you know, sort of like those goosebumps type of horror, it's not scary necessarily, it's more creepy, and I think they did a good job of that, and I really did appreciate that. Um, the editing here I thought was great. The intro didn't come in until 18 minutes, and as you guys saw, it was a silent intro, and I don't know if there's gonna, they're gonna add music to that, but that itself is really weird. I did hear there's gonna be recap songs, where, like, they have a folk song, um, it's kinda like what Galvin did with the recap song, so that's kinda fun. Uh, if you guys saw my Tony live stream, you heard about that, so I think that's really interesting. Um, but overall, guys, I really did enjoy the first episode, this was really solid overall, um, I'm definitely going to continue watching the show. Let me know what you guys saw this first episode. Love to your thoughts on it. I overall really did enjoy it. Uh, like I said, for me, the only thing not really working is Tony Shalhoub, and then the tone was a bit unbalanced. But other than that, I'm really confident this show is going to be a lot of fun. I think this is totally the kind of show you can watch during the summer. Summer, you know, you can have some really serious shows, but a lot of shows, summer should have some really fun TV, and this seems like exactly the the perfect summer show. I heard someone say that, and yeah, it is. Summer doesn't need to be a crazy, you know, all this crazy complex TV. You can have a show that's just a lot of fun. That's what brain that is. It looks like a lot of fun. I think I'm going to have a lot of fun with the show. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing all these characters, you know, seeing what ends up happening with them, who ends up getting infected, why, you know, why is this happening all of a sudden? We don't really know. But let me know what you guys saw this first episode. Love to your thoughts on it. We'll see you guys in my next video, which will be for the series premiere of Animal Kingdom, and we'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.